We're with Georgina Woods of uh, Climate Action Network Australia. Um, we just heard in a uh, press conference where you said it's been a very smooth opening to the COP so far. Can you tell us what you mean by that? that it's been, uh, we've been had a big build up process towards this meeting, there's been a lot of rhetoric flying around, there's been a lot of intensity and that's because there's been so many big political questions put off until this year. Uh, in that context I think that the opening of this meeting, meeting has been relatively smooth. Um, we, we opened up, the agendas were adopted and today uh, you know, dozens and dozens of informal meetings are underway where the negotiators are getting down to the business of finalising the practical details of the outcome come from Durban uh, so that they can get it all ready in time for when the ministers arrive next week. And how does that relate, how is that different from what we've seen in previous years? Well I think in, in, in other years when the, the negotiations, the preparations for the actual practical matters that will be agreed are less developed, um, it, it's much more likely to be a volatile opening because people are confused about where things are going to go. For this meeting, because there's been so much work done this year and there has been a real spirit of uh, getting down to business and, and implementing the Cancun agreements and dealing with the matters that haven't been yet um, formalised from the Bali Action Plan, that people will feel more confident that the process actually can deliver a functional outcome. In Copenhagen, you know, it was very, very different because it was so clear to everybody that work hadn't progressed to a, to a degree that a, an outcome could be confidently um, secured and so there was uh, so much more apprehension and, and worry at, fr right from the beginning of the meeting uh, about w where it was going to go. Who can we thank for all that work getting done in advance this time? Well, I think that the platform that was agreed at the Cancun, in Cancun last year provided a really strong foundation for the work to proceed this year. Out of Cancun, as well as the really, you know, the important agreements that we got to limit warming to two degrees or less, to hold a review of the adequacy of that goal from 2013 onwards, to capture the mitigation actions of the world's biggest polluting countries, as well as those big ticket items that we got out of Cancun, there was also a very clear uh, roadmap for this year. Year of, of matters that had to be sorted through and were to be decided at this meeting. And I think the clarity of the Cancun agreements is, has played out in a, a very strong work ethic in the negotiators at the UNFCCC this year and hopefully it will translate into a strong outcome from Durban. And we've heard a lot already this week about uh, the US potentially obstructing a green climate fund that everyone thought was almost signed and delivered, uh, Canada possibly pulling out the Kyoto Protocol involved in negotiations there. Um, how can you say that we're moving, everything's been so smooth if we've heard all these problems about various countries? Well, the smoothness is really about the practical details that have to be sorted out before those big political decisions can be made. Today, the Green Climate Fund is going to be discussed in the COP plenary, and so we will find out how that is going to, uh, whether or not that really important piece of institutional architecture for global climate cooperation is going to be set up from this meeting. But those big things like Kyoto and what the United States will do, uh, whether they'll be part of a new treaty to, uh, you know, to, make, to make real mitigation commitments for the first time, those are going to be put off until next week. And so the smooth progress is really about the nitty gritty nuts and bolts details. But yeah, there's some really big arguments looming and the United States is at the centre of this meeting in the sense that we've never yet seen them take internationally binding mitigation commitments. And the time has long since passed that they needed to do that. And at this meeting, they need to stop playing a destructive role and an exceptional role and join the rest of the international community in mitigating climate change and facing the challenges of the future. Is there any reason to believe they'll do that this time around? Well, I think the reason to believe that they will do it is because they, the United States government has said that they understand the importance of climate change and has said that they're committed to meeting their mitigation target that they put on the table in Copenhagen. So if they are committed to it and they, and they do accept the intense urgency of this problem, then they will have no choice but to move along with the rest of the international community. I think the international community needs to put the hard word on the United States and really um, give them an ultimatum at some point during this fortnight to say, well, we, the rest of us are moving ahead and we really need you to join us because you know, you have no, never yet made internationally binding mitigation commitments. So is the US the only major uh, country we need to be watching in these talks or are there other countries that uh, we should keep an eye on? Well I think for all of the countries that are members of the major, major economies forum, there's 20 countries um, that are the biggest 20 emitting countries in the world, each of them has their peccadilloes and their particular points of national interest that they're trying to pursue. So yeah, for all of them there would be 
things that they have resisted uh, taking part in that they need to shift on in this meeting and that's really about shifting their view from being about what they can get out of these meetings to thinking about what they can offer the international community as part of a cooperative effort to avoid two degrees warming. Any specific countries that we should be looking at? Well I can tell you about my country. <laughs> I'm from Australia and I think a big part of Australia's role in this meeting is going to be to sign up to the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol with an emissions reduction target that is our fair share of a two degree scenario. We've, we've the time has passed for delay and now that Australia has an emissions trading scheme, it's now got the mechanisms in place domestically to meet a better emissions reduction target than they've currently got on the table. Um, for other countries there are other specific things, you know, some countries resist um, <coughs> committing to mobilising sources of finance, some countries are resistant to the setting up of the Green Climate Fund. Each of them has their, uh, as I said, their national interest that they're trying to pursue and I think that as the week progresses, we need to see them drawing together as a community uh, rather than bunkering down into their individual national interests. And CAN is an, an international network of activist organizations around the world. Uh, what are those, those organizations doing to pressure those governments? Well, around the world, um, there, are, there is a growing movement of people who recognise the urgency of climate change and are taking action domestically in their countries to try and force their governments uh, to, to step up to the plate. And we just heard in the Cannes press conference about the invidious influence that fossil fuel companies have on national governments and I think you do see that playing out here in terms of a lower, uh, lower ambition from governments because they're too afraid to really commit to the kinds of actions that they need to take because their domestic policy has been so badly influenced by fossil fuel companies. But around the world there are people who are fighting new coal-fired power stations, who are fighting coal mines, who are fighting tar sands um, uh, extraction proposals and those people are in a real way contributing to the ambition of the outcome here because as long as national governments can see people in their communities calling for them to do the right thing on climate change then they'll be empowered to do so. So are you hopeful that at the end of next week after all the political decisions and the, the big hitters show up here to, to have discussions that we'll have a positive outcome here? I think that we can't afford not to have a positive outcome from Durban. I, don't, I can't say that that will happen, but I can say that if that doesn't happen, the chances of us avoiding two degrees warming and stopping the world from tipping over into runaway dangerous climate change that's no longer within the control of human beings to change uh, are almost gone. And so it's difficult to make predictions at this stage. I think certainly the conditions are there for the world to come to an agreement here that's capable of meeting the goals that they set in Cancun. But self-interest, the influence of fossil fuel companies, um, the stolid reactionary politicians, you know, they can always ruin outcomes for the rest of us, but the opportunity is there to do it and I sincerely hope that they do. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you very much.